want to uh, study practical chess endgames that are going to really help us in our practice. And uh, I, uh, as a reminder, would like to again uh, tell you about rook endings. Rook endings are by far the most frequently occurring chess endings. Of course you'll have queen endings, of course you'll have king and pawn endgames, you'll have minor piece endgames, but the rook endings tend to be at least half, at least half of all of the major end games that you're going to ever play. And it's really, really easy to lose king and pawn end games uh, when you don't have some knowledge. In fact, so much so that the uh, game that I've chosen is actually a game that uh, the world champion Magnus Carlsen lost in a rook ending where he was a pawn down, he was a pawn behind, and um, he didn't draw a game he should have. So it's very easy to lose rook and pawn in games. Uh, on the other hand, uh, certain rook and pawn end games are very easy to win so long as you know the proper technique. Uh, this comes from Lucina, the Lucina position. Gosh, I have it in my mind, it's like 1497. So we're talking about an endgame that's been known for 500 years. The idea of these endings is that whenever you're a pawn ahead, as is this situation, where your king, the aggressive side, the pawn with the pawn, the side with the pawn advantage, whenever his king is on the promotion square, it's a win except when there are a there are pawns on the a file and h file and we'll look at that next but any pawn on the gf do, 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 all the way over to the b file whenever you have a position like this it's a win but how to win it the direct way is if you move your king then what happens is black just keeps giving a series of checks and no progress is being made. He's just giving you all of these checks and you're right back in the place you started. Then white black makes a tempo. So all of those moves, and now you've got to be careful that you don't fall into a three move repetition as you've allowed all kinds of checks. So how on earth can you win this game? How can you win this position? And the basic idea is that you're going to have to move your king either to the a a C file or to the A file and to block your opponent from giving you a check. Yeah? So the winning move if you're not familiar, is a little bit strange. The winning move is to come up with the rook. Rook uh, to d4. Now basically, black cannot move. He, he has to wait. And we'll try to understand what white's idea is. Let's say white, black, pardon me, waits by tempoing with his rook. Now we're ready. King c7, and we're threatening now to make a queen. Black has no choice but to give a check. Once more, we are threatening to make a queen. Black has no choice but to give a check, and now we wait. King c6. Now, in this exact moment, white is not threatening to queen. So, uh, because you will take the new queen. So, black has a move, so to speak. It, uh, it is Black's turn to play, and he can make a move. Let's say he waits. Now, White plays Rook, oops, excuse me, Rook to d5. And now what White's idea is, he's going to block with his Rook, and so it's a very easy win now. Check and suddenly there's no more checks along the B file, and we win. Let's go back a few moves 
to this position. And we didn't, last time we made a waiting move. If we make a check, king comes to b, g, <laughs> to b5, check, rook. And again, this is a winning uh, idea. Okay, let's go back to this position. And let's imagine that black had waited with king here. Now how can white win? That's a question for yourselves. How should white win this position? Young man. White to move. White to play and win. White to play. Not so sure. Okay. Whenever you get into these ki king and rook and pawn versus king, rook, one of the things you should always be trying to do is push the defender's king away. Obviously, the two kings are in opposition. So it's always a very, very good idea to give check. Let's imagine we give a check. If black's king allows white's rook to come down, then white is threatening to promote the pawn to a queen and to capture with the rook. And now rook checks are ineffective. The king just come, walks its way all the way back to the rook and white wins. Back here a moment. If black plays the move king back to uh, f7, protecting the square uh, e8, now you play rook here. And once again, all you're trying to do is bring your rook across so that you can promote the pawn. OK. Oops, excuse me. So this is a win. Uh, Mike, did you have a question? Uh, yes. uh, can't you just play a... Uh, what? Uh, no? you, you can keep going. I'm sorry. Just, just in that final position. Uh, how about uh, right here for white? Yes. White move, right? Right. Can uh, you just play rook to c4 in this position? Yes. Rook oh, to like king to c7. Uh, if you could get rook to c4 and king to c7, that would be an easy win. But wow. he'll stop you with king back to d. That would, indeed, that would be a very easy win uh, because you've stopped the rook from checking. So that would be a very nice one. Um, here, so, uh, oops, <laughs> I should hit OK. So you can see. All right. This is not the Lucena position. So whenever you have a B, C, D, E, F, G pawn with a king in front, it's always a win. It's always a win. The A pawn, as well as the H pawn, require uh, that the defender's king be four files away from um, the promoting pawn. How can white win this position? How can white win this position? Yes, Ingrid. Sorry? Rook d4. Uh, yeah, rook e4, pardon me, mm. sorry, rook e4. Okay, and then we wait. Then king b7. And now because you're threatening to make a queen, I have to give you a check. King a6, and now once again, because you're threatening to make a queen, I'll give you a check. And now I don't want to give you another check because I see your clever play. Your idea is if I give you a check, you move king here, 
check, and block. Huh? So you'll, you'll reach this position and I'll wait. I'll make a tempo. Yes, and that's the point. Rook e8, and you get that same position like we had a moment ago, where all of these checks basically just bring the white king, and eventually you get to a position where you'll be able to promote your pawn to a queen. Yes? What about uh, getting your rook from the starting position uh, to b6, followed by king to b7? Right. So one of the things that you can do is play rook over, rook to b1, and in case the king comes over, you can put your king, imp importantly, and I don't have this checking and uh, checking device, yes? So uh, you only have this possibility of winning it, if, for example, this would be really, really terrible. When the defender's king, excuse me, when the defender's king is this close, he traps uh, the opponent's king in uh, the corner, and so you cannot uh, get out. So that's why you need these files. Uh, um, for example, king, check, king, and you're not making any progress. So in this position, what we discover is that this king is simply too close, and it controls too many squares. So there has to be a distance when you have the A or H pawns. You said it needed to be four files. Before you had it five files. Did I? It yeah, needed on the light square on uh, four file. Seven, yeah, I think seven, I, I think I had it right here. So one. I'm ca sorry. Maybe I'm counting it wrong. One, two, three, four, five. Yes. You, you said four files away. So th this is five files away, right? Yes, this is five files. So the king could. But it was be a four. File closer, and you'd still be okay. Let me check that. Let's see. Let's say in this position we wait, and we go here, and we go here, and now let's say I go here. So yes, in this position I'm seeing this is a win. So I, w I, I wanted to send fragments, but somehow sending them to Ben's computer <laughs> didn't seem to work. Um, <clears throat> the next position, and this is a very vital one, uh, this position is known as the Philidor position. Essentially, a moment ago, if we could put, if, if we could trade king put places and put this white king in front of the pawn and this king off of the promotion square, white wins. It's a simple, easy win as we've seen building a bridge. In this position, it's a kind of a zugzwang a mutual zugzwang. The idea is if it's white to move, white wins. If it's black to move, black draws. Okay. The Philidor defense is very, very simple. Uh, black to move draws. What black should do is step back with his rook along the sixth rank. If it was the colors were, were reversed, it would be the third rank. What black the defender needs to do is he needs to get white to push his pawn. As soon as white pushes his pawn to e6, the rook comes down and checks us from behind. So let's say that it's black to, black to play and black does not know the Philidor defense. Instead, black errors, oh, I've got to make it uh, black to move, sorry. Black errors with this very bad move. The king comes up, and now uh, white is threatening to play check and, and force the king out of the way of the pawn. Now after check, the king comes here, 
and we're threatening a mate. Well, or at least, let's say, a very important check. The black king is forced to give up the defense, and now white will simply advance his pawn all the way up. He'll advance his pawn, then his king, then his pawn, and he'll get a winning position, the Lucena position. So back to the start. And after this bad move by white, black should play this. This is a crucial move. Rook to g6, closing across the third rank. What could white do? If white moves his rook and just plays around with his rook, black is waiting. He just waits. He waits until white advances his pawn. Oops, have I done it wrong? The moment white's pawn goes to escape, the moment white's pawn gets to the e6 square, now you drop behind, and there's no shelter for the king. If the pawn were up on e5, the e square, e6 square would be the shelter. And so now you can just forever harass the white king. Check, check, check. Eventually, when the king gets too far away from the pawn on e6, we'll just go back and attack it. And that's an easy draw. Let's go back to the start. And let's see how you would win the position if it was white's turn. What would you play? You have only one winning move. Julian? King d6. King d6. That is the winning move. King e6 would throw away the win because then we would be right back in the Philidor position. So king d6, and let's see why this is the winning move. All right. So let's say I... Um, my problem is if I check you, now you're threatening me with mate in one. Yeah? And if I move away with my king, now my king is no longer there. The moment I get this position, it is impossible to stop white from pushing his pawn and getting the winning position. OK. So let's say in this moment, I come down. Oops, sorry. I don't give you a check. I come down right away. And now, how are you going to win the position? Um. Uh, sorry, say it again, please. White plays with his rook, and that's correct, but where? Julian. Rook a8. Rook a8 check. King has to go here. Yeah. E6. Let's say I go king here. King e7. King e7 is good. You, you, in this particular case, you don't have to be fancy schmancy. Yeah, exactly. You could go to e, uh, e7. Let's say I had gone king here. Rook f8. Let's say I go on king here. Again, the funny part is in this case you don't have to be fancy. And again, and these rook checks just basically uh, white crawls back to the checking rook, and in the meantime, you queen the pawn. These <coughs> practical rook endings. I cannot re repeat to yourself how many times I've had both sides. I've been a pawn down, made a draw without a problem, been a pawn up, and made a win because I knew the proper technique. The game I wanted to bring to your attention I thought was a pretty interesting game. It was from Magnus Carlsen. It was a, a Wang Hao, a, ch a grandmaster from China. And the tournament was played in Norway at their most prestigious chess tournament of the year, the Norway Chess 
event, the Norway Chess Tournament. And um, the players reached the following ending. Magnus Carlsen, the world champion, had white pieces. And this is a very simple four versus three ending. The difference here is that normally speaking, this pawn on d5 in a normal uh, four versus three might be, for example, on the e6 square. At the moment, uh, this pawn is passed. So clearly, uh, white is the defender and trying to keep uh, everything uh, um, together. Magnus Carlsen lost this ending. And this really, really shocked the chess world because uh, Magnus is really world-renowned for not only being a great grinder himself, but he's the guy who's supposed to be winning these endings, not losing them. And especially because we thought that this ending was a, uh, a draw. Not necessarily an easy draw for, for white, but certainly a draw. King f6, king e3, king over. Okay, so the normal drawing technique is that when you're the defender in such positions, you put your rook behind uh, the passed pawn. And that's what Magnus did. And here, uh, we were all very surprised that Magnus simply didn't keep his rook, again, just behind the passed pawn. It makes it very, very hard for uh, black uh, to make progress. So the first principle is to keep your rooks behind the pass pawn. <laughs> Don't forget that one. That makes it really easy. Now, rook check. OK, so uh, the idea of Wang Hao was that if white's king moved to d4, he wanted to bring his rook to f3 and go after this pawn on f2. So Magnus played king f4, and we got here. A moment ago, when uh, white could have put his rook behind, excuse me, excuse me, when white could have put his rook behind the pawn, Magnus would have a choice of whether to put his king on f3 or d3. Now he really sh doesn't. He put his king on d3. Uh, Julian? If, if uh, Magnus had played rook d8 instead of rook b7, then yeah. white played rook b6? Yes, of course. So let's go back to that a moment ago. So we are here, here, rook uh, here. And then what Julian asks is, can I, can't couldn't black play rook d6, basically forcing the rook aside for a moment. All right, now let's say I move. A moment ago, you saw Wang Hao was checking. Now his rook's behind. Now the question is, how can you make progress? If you move your king, something like this actually happened in the game, by the way. So it's interesting to compare. In this position, I want to check you like this. Yeah? So my king is blockading this pawn. My king is blockading the pawn, tying down the rook, and your king cannot enter me enter on the king side. Let's see what happened after rook b7. Basically what I wanted to say is after the check, Magnus had to play his king to d3. The problem, oops, excuse me, the problem if he had played his king to f3 is nobody's really guarding the d-pawn anymore. Nobody's really guarding the d-pawn anymore. And after, whoops, let's go, rook e1, now white has to be very careful that the pawn just doesn't make it up the board. The rook on d8, that wouldn't be the case. OK, so check, rook e1. Now we have a series of moves, and we're back. OK, so now we're back to very, very safe territory. This is really, really um, uh, easy draw, let's say. In the game, um, Wang Hao, he's basically he, he, he's, he's hit a roadblock. 
He can't advance his king on the king's side. He can't advance his pawn. His rook is protecting the pawn. Uh, he played back, king back. Now, in this position, I was a bit surprised, <coughs> well, actually more than a bit surprised by Magnus' choice. Magnus in the game, he played the move rook g7. This was played in the game, rook g7. Would that have been your choice? How would you, if you were the defender in this position, have defended it? I would have played Very good. Very good. Maintain your rook behind the pawn. Rook to d8. This was a very strange decision by Magnus. Rook g7, forcing the opponent to advance his pawn, g5. Magnus goes rook h7, and now we have g4. Now already, things aren't getting are getting a little bit nervous here for white. In the game, Magnus took f takes g4. Why didn't Magnus play f4? <coughs> Young man. Absolutely. Rook e1. If you wanted to play rook f5, shame on you. Look at that rook on f5. This would, this would be, uh, the rook is almost stuck. Is it, it would be a terrible move. But rook e1, and suddenly, after rook takes h5, rook to g1, black has suddenly real chances of winning the game. Because he wants to put his rook, to take this pawn on g3, put his rook on h3, and on a very good day, be able to bring his king to Five. So in the game, Magnus captured. Capture, capture. We reach this position. And it's still a draw. It's still a draw, only Magnus is making it more and more difficult for himself. Uh, in the game, he, Magnus has played rook g7, f5, rook g6, king here. And here, Magnus made a very strange move. He moved his rook, rook to a6. Well, obviously he has a passed pawn in the position. Why didn't Magnus play h5? You know. F4. F4. Takes. And takes. Easy draw. Easy draw. That's what Magnus should be trying to do, h5. If you come down like we had that previous variation, if you come down here with rook here, now I'll activate my king. If you go over, I'll activate my king. And if you take, I'll take this pawn. And I'll make a very easy draw with white. Magnus did not do that. The world champion played rook here. And already, things are starting to get a little bit tricky after this move, rook down. Magnus played king to d2, which was a, oh, pardon me. Yes, Julian. Could I also draw with rook d6, which he beat? Yes, rook d6 was also much, much stronger. I like the move h5. I think h5 is the simplest, but definitely rook d6 was also uh, an excellent choice. I just didn't understand this move, rook a6 at all. Now, um, once again, uh, the, uh, Magnus made a very strange choice, king d2. Again, I don't think it's losing after this move. It only makes it white's task that much harder. Normally speaking, whenever you're the defender in these rook endings, it's it's really vital. In fact, it's super necessary that you be as active as possible. A much stronger decision was to play king d4. The idea of king d4 is not only because you want to capture this pawn on d5, but also you're looking for opportunities of going to e5 and capturing this pawn as well. 
asked to explain why he uh, played this move king d2, Magnus said that he thought he had calculated out the game and he saw that it was a draw. He, saw, he thought he saw a forced draw. So his idea was to defend kind of like the Philidor style, right? To defend along the third rank. Check. Now again, white's king is now suddenly very, very passive. A moment ago it was on d4, sometimes it was going to e5. Now it's been driven all the way back down to the first rank, and we get this position. This is the position Magnus had, had foreseen. He thought that his past h-pawn, he was just going to run his past h-pawn up the board, and he would have everything under control. He was wrong. <laughs> Rook h2, h6, d4. King g1, rook h3. And now I think this was the losing moment right here. I think that after the move king g2, it's lost. And that king f2 uh, was uh, just a tempo uh, to save the game. Let's see how Magnus lost it after king g2. Interestingly, in reading the comments of both players after the game, both players thought this position was a draw. And they were just playing on, you know, because the crowd, <laughs> you know, like he's a pawn up. You. And then suddenly Wang Hao saw the winning variation. Remember those, uh, those positions I was just showing you? We've got one. Only this time, there's a lot more pawns on the board. OK. Now, before, we knew, how, we knew how to build a bridge when there were no pawns on the board. In the moment, the rook is kind of like off sides. But how can black build a bridge in this position? How could black build a bridge? You, yeah, yeah. And then your rook along the third rank can block a check. F4, king e2. Now you're ready to play rook to d3. Pardon me? Now you're ready to play rook to d3 and queen. Rook to e3 also. Well, at the moment, you're threatening to queen. You just queen and take the rook. And that would be the end of the game. So Magnus had to give a check. That answers your question. <laughs> Wouldn't the rook either? Ye yes, it would. OK. Now, Let's think about this. Well, white can't prevent b black from queening, but maybe white can queen. Now, if we imagine push, queen, queen, this looks like a drawing rook, uh, queen and pawn endgame. But is it? No, Magnus lost. Why did Magnus lose? What could, white, what could black do here? that gives him victory. Young man. Queen F3 check. check. Correct. What? Queen F1 check. Queen F1 check. Bravo. You guys have gotten it. You got it. Yes. G3 check. How sweet. You have to take with the king. Check. And you have to go now to the h file, either to the h4 square or to the h5 square. h3 or h4 square, it doesn't matter. And check. And you win the queen. So very, very nice play by Wang Hao. And this ending is known for many years as a drawn ending.
exactly. Let's go back to the, this position where uh, we were here. So we sh he should have gone king f2 in the game. Just a second, I'll just uh, notation. Yes, king f2. Okay, so the difference is not to allow that king, black's king, to come running all the way up the board. And that was a big difference, yes, yes. So here, so when you guys play a rook and pawn end game and you know you go home and you put it in your chess engine and the chess engine says equal, 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 and then suddenly it goes minus 10, <laughs> you know, you, you discovered a move that suddenly your game is completely lost, well, console yourselves. It happens to the best of the best, including the world champions, and rook endings can be very tricky. Uh, the general rule of thumb is you absolutely should put your rook behind s pawns, whether you're the defender or the aggressor. You've got to know the Lucena position. You've got to know the Philidor position. And that will help you in an enormous degree. When I study rook and pawn endgames, I like to have a guide. I've always said this about an opening. If I'm going to learn an opening, I want to learn it from somebody who's really, really super professional and knows the opening inside out. If I'm going to learn a Grunfeld, I want Peter Svidler to be my guide. If any of you are having trouble with Rook and Pound Endgames, your guide should be Vasily Smyslov. Okay? You just go to the database, you get your database, and you just, uh, what you do is there's the games of Vasily Smyslov, you just click the final position. If it's a Rook ending, go earlier and see how he won it or drew it. If it's, if it's over in 20 moves, you click to the next game. Vasily Smyslov um, um, essentially uh, Bobby Fischer, this is what B Bobby Fischer thought about Vasily Smyslov's Rook Endings. Bobby Fischer got the original book, Rook Endings, by Vasily Smyslov in Russian. He got the book and uh, took the uh, Russian English dictionary and for every single word he translated it into English. He, he crossed it out and he wrote in the English word. Okay, and he did this for the entire book. I don't want to say he memorized the book, but he believed Vasily Smyslov. <laughs> he believed Vasily Smyslov was the best rook, rook ending player in the world. And, well, if it was good enough for Bobby Fischer, <laughs> good enough for me, good enough for you.